I'd like to explore with you some concepts that have been emerging in my field of adult education that I think may have some rather revolutionary implications for all of education. Traditionally, education has been based upon assumptions about learning that have been derived from our experience with animals and with children uh, and with research, from research uh, with animals and children that have been given the label pedagogy. Adults have been taught according to a different set of assumptions by successful teachers of adults who've known for a long time that they had to, to deviate from or depart from the traditional assumptions of pedagogy if they were to be successful or effective with helping adults to learn. Pedagogy is derived from the Greek uh, word paid, P-A-I-D, meaning child, and agogos, meaning leading. And so literally, means the art and science of teaching children. So that to speak of the pedagogy of adult education is contradictory, and yet this is what uh, we have been doing for many years. But in the last decade or so, uh, in adult education there has been emerging a competing or differentiated set of assumptions about learning uh, that is being, in order to contrast it with, uh, with pedagogy, is being given a new label, andragogy, A-N-D-R-A-G-O-G-Y, which is derived from the stem of the Greek word aner, A-N-E-R, meaning man as distinguished from boy, and therefore means the art and science of helping adults to learn. Now what I'd like to do rather briefly is to examine with you the assumptions of pedagogy as contrasted with those of andragogy, and then draw some implications uh, uh, of these different, different assumptions for the art and science of teaching. There are five main sets of assumptions uh, that differentiate pedagogy from andragogy. The first having to do with the self-concept of the learner. Pedagogy assumes that a learner is, in effect, a dependent personality. And I think this is true of very young children. They are indeed dependent upon the adult world to make decisions for them. But uh, my own speculation is that as the child matures, he moves toward a self-concept increasingly of autonomy or self-directiveness. And psychologically, we define adulthood as uh, the uh, arrival at a, at a self-concept of self-directedness. So andragogy assumes that the learner has a self-concept of being self-directive. A, a second set of assumptions that differentiates pedagogy from andragogy has to do with the role of experience in learning. <clears throat> pedagogy assumes that, uh, that uh, children and youth have very little experience that's, that's of much worth in learning and therefore take little of, uh, account of or make little use of the experience of the learners. Andragogy, on the other hand, assumes that adults have accumulated a good deal of experience in the process of living, which in itself is a resource for learning. And therefore, therefore andragogy uh, makes, uh, makes use of techniques that dip into and exploit the resource of the, uh, of the students as uh, uh, of value for learning. The third set of assumptions has to do with the readiness of the learner, the development of readiness to learn. And pedagogy assumes that readiness to learn is the product of two forces. One, biological development, uh, the, the development of the strength of the leg muscles, for example, to support the body is a precondition to a child's being ready to learn to walk. And then the second force, uh, academic pressure or social pressure. Uh, the assumption pedagogues make is that if the school tells a child you're ready to learn fractions in grade four, that he will be ready to learn fractions in grade four. Andragogy, on the other hand, assumes that readiness to learn develops as the adult confronts developmental tasks. In the, in the course of his becoming effective in performing social roles that require him to learn how to do certain things. Let me illustrate this in, in terms of the role of worker, for example. As the adult confronts uh, having to get a job, if he doesn't yet know much about how to get a job, he will be readiest to learn at that point those things he needs to know in order to be able to get a job. Once he has a job, his developmental task becomes one of becoming secure in the job, learning all he can to be proficient in the job so he won't get fired from the job. So his readiness at that point is to learn those things that have to do with becoming secure in the job. 
having become secure in the job, his next developmental task is getting ahead in the job. And so at that point, he's ready to learn those things that have to do with improving his uh, grade level uh, in the job, uh, uh, becoming a supervisor, becoming an executive, or even getting a, a, another better job. And then the final developmental task in the role of worker is uh, getting out of a job, retiring for, from a job. And it's not until the, the, the worker reaches the point of really almost being ready to retire that he's, he's really ready to learn about retiring from the job. The fourth a set of assumptions that distinguish pedagogy from andragogy have to do with the time perspective of the learner. Now, the pedagogy assumes that the learner has a time perspective of postponed application. Um, pedagogical teachers assume that, that students are interested in learning those things that they will, they will be able to make use of later. For example, uh, in grade school, I learned those things I thought would be useful for me to get into high school. In high school, I learned those things I thought would be useful for me to get into college. In college, I learned those things I thought would be useful for me to get a job and perhaps live a richer life as an adult. Always postpone application. Andragogy assumes, on the other hand, that the time perspective of the adult is out of immediate application. Uh, it's our experience that adults come in with uh, needs in their life today that they want to get help in dealing more effectively with, and that's what they want to learn. So that they w what they learn today, they want to be able to apply to their life tomorrow. And the final set of assumptions has to do with the orientation of learning. Pedagogy assumes that the, because of the uh, uh, time perspective of postponed application, the child or youth has an orientation to learning of subject matter acquisition or so that he comes in with a subject-centered uh, approach to learning. The accumulation of subject matter is the way he defines the learning process. The adult, on the other hand, because of his time perspective of, imme of immediate application, has, an orient has a problem-centered orientation to learning. He comes in with the notion that he will learn those things that will be help him to cope more effectively with current life problems. Well, these are the basic, uh, um, the, the, the central, assumptions, let's say, that differentiate uh, pedagogy from andragogy. I'm sure there are many others, but these I see to be the central ones. Now, what are the implications of these assumptions for, uh, for the practice of teaching, designing and conducting learning uh, ac activities? Basically, I see the difference being uh, between a content-focused uh, approach to learning and a process-focused approach to learning. Uh, pedago pedagogues traditionally come into a classroom or any other uh, educational activity with a content design. They have thought out in advance, the teacher or the curriculum committee has thought out in advance what units of subject matter need to be transmitted to the passive learner and the content plan or organizes these units of, of uh, content in a logical sequence uh, uh, and chooses the most effective methods or techniques of transmitting those units of content. The andragogue, on the other hand, comes into a learning ex uh, uh, situation with a process design, a design that, that takes the learners and the teacher together through a series of process steps. Now let me just uh, uh, describe quickly what I see to be the differences uh, between the two approaches in regard to uh, the process design. The first element in the process design, uh, in the andragogical process design, uh, is, the, is climate setting. The first phase is climate setting. Pedagogy assumes that the appropriate climate for learning is an authority-centered climate, a respect for authority uh, or, and discipline and this sort of thing. This is the required atmosphere uh, for pedagogical learning. Andragogy assumes that the learners will, will be more induced, more uh, uh, motivated to learn in an atmosphere that is, that is more mutual in its uh, uh, character, in its flavor, which there's a spirit of mutuality, mutual respect, mutual uh, responsibility, um, warmth, uh, friendliness, uh, informality, relationship. These are uh, characteristics of the andragogical climate. So the andragogue comes in with a plan for uh, uh, setting this kind of climate as the first thing he does in meeting a new class of students, for example. 
The second phase or element in the process design is establishing a planning structure, a structure that will en enable the, uh, the, the students to work with the teacher in planning. Now, in, in, pe in pedagogy, the planning is all done by the teacher. The teacher comes in with the plan and, and, and just uh, places it on the, the students, so to speak. In andragogy, we, we uh, have experimented with a number of ways of involving the students with the teacher in the planning through the use of steering committees, planning committees, uh, or even involving the whole class in uh, perhaps little task forces, each to take a part of the responsibility for planning. The third phase or element in the process design is the uh, diagnosing of the needs of interests, uh, the, the uh, diagnosing of the needs and interests of the learners in learning. Uh, now, according to pedagogy, the diagnostic process is wholly in the hands of the teacher. The teacher decides what the students need to learn. Uh, andragogy is putting a good deal of emphasis on developing creative ways of involving the students in examining a model of excellence to which they would like to aspire, and then assessing where they stand in their own competency development in relation to that model of excellence. So that uh, the, the third phase in, a, in an andragogic classroom uh, is concerned with involving the students in diagnosing their unique individual needs for learning in that particular classroom situation. The fourth phase is uh, concerned with formulating the objectives that will translate these needs into uh, uh, end, end goals. Um, adult ed pedagogy, in, in pedagogy, the teacher decides what the objectives uh, will be and then simply announces them to the students. In adult education, we have found it very important to involve the students in formulating the objectives with the teacher and uh, spelling out in their terms what uh, it is they want to accomplish in the, in the course. The fifth uh, element or phase in the process design has to do with designing a, a, a plan or a set of sequential learning experiences. Now in uh, pedagogy, the teacher plans the design, designs the sequence of, of learning experiences, whereas in andragogy, uh, we involve the student, uh, the students in sharing with the teacher responsibility for designing a sequence that's based on the readiness of the adults to learn. Uh, and in, incidentally, because of the great difference in readiness among a group of adults, uh, uh, andragogical designs tend to have a lot of room for individual work or for small subgroup work. The sixth phase or element in the process design is that of conducting the learning experiences, implementing the, the, the design. In pedagogy, the primary responsibility for, uh, for conducting the learning, uh, for uh, conducting the activities, is in the hands of the teacher. The teacher gives the lectures, assigns the readings, shows the, the, the canned audiovisual uh, material, uh, takes full responsibility for the learning, for the teaching transaction, learning teaching transaction. In andragogy, on the other hand, uh, we put a good deal of emphasis on the teachers and on the students and the teacher sharing that responsibility, involving the teacher, the, the students to the extent that we can in, uh, in going out and getting information that is, is needed uh, in, the, in the classroom and then bringing it back and sharing it with the other students. In my own practice, for example, at, uh, at the graduate level at Boston University, I make a good deal of use of what I call learning teaching teams in which those students who are particularly interested in, a, in one of the units of the course will take responsibility for finding out all they can about that unit, then devising a way of coming back and sharing the most critical learnings that they've gained with the rest of the students with me there as a facilitator and a, 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 a resource person to, to build on what the, the learning teaching team does. The final uh, element or phase in the process design is uh, evaluation. Evaluating both what has been learned uh, and re-diagnosing further needs for learning on the part of the students and also evaluating the effectiveness of the course. I see evaluation, for example, as being a very mutual thing, whereas in pedagogy, the teacher does the evaluating, the teacher gives the grade, the teacher decides whether the course has been effective or not, by and large. I see andragogy as being, uh, evaluation, andragogically, as being a, a mutual process in which the, 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 the students are evaluating what they've learned and also evaluated how effectively I have helped them learn. Now, I think that this di the difference can best be symbolized, the difference in the two designs can best be symbolized by what I see to be the difference in the role of the teacher. In pedagogy, 
the, the, the teacher's role is defined as that of a transmitter of the wisdom or the information or the knowledge. Whereas in andragogy, the teacher's role is defined as the facilitator and resource person in a process of mutual self-directed learning. Malcolm, your earlier discussion about the derivation of the word andragogy, I, I found that very interesting. Uh, is this something that you coined yourself? No, actually, a Dutch adult educator has just recently made a, uh, a study of the history of the word of uh, the use of the word andragogy, and was able to to identify the first use uh, by a German adult educator in, in the uh, early 1830s, and then he's, he he found it appearing in literature in Germany, in France, in uh, other European countries by other educators independently. None of them knew that it had been used by uh, a previous person. I first uh, ran into it uh, from a Yugoslavian adult oh. educator in the summer of 1968 who came over uh, to participate in, our, in a workshop I was doing and told me that they, were, uh, they have an institute of andragogy at the University of Belgrade. And um, that in fact, they have an, uh, an institute of, of, of a pedagogy and andragogy at uh, in, in Holland, and um, it's used very frequently now in Europe, and I started using it in the United States in 1967. It seemed to me, as the Yugoslavian adult educator told me about it, it seemed to me to, to help to sharpen the, the, at least to put the focus on the difference in the assumptions between pedagogy and andragogy. Uh, many of your assumptions in, in talking about this, uh, you used examples primarily of adults and working in adult education. Uh, what about the a wider application of this uh, as far as working with youth in the classroom? Yeah, uh, I'm glad you asked that because I expected you would because this is something I frequently get from uh, when I work with uh, uh, secondary and, uh, and college uh, audiences. And so I had this chart prepared <laughs> that uh, will enable me to explain more clearly uh, how I see the process working. If we if we use this end of the chart as representing infancy in the middle adolescence and the far side uh, adulthood, as I see it, the infant really is dependent. Uh, he, he needs to have the adult world to uh, take care of him. But as soon as the child starts moving out of the crib and, and gaining any sort of mobility, he starts making decisions of his own. Sure. And uh, his, his capacity to make decisions and his need to, to be self-directing I see as increasing at about this rate, so that uh, uh, somewhere during adolescence, it reaches a 100% uh, uh, of capacity and need to be self-directing. But now, this dotted line represents what I perceive the culture to assume that the capacity to be self-directing to be. Uh, when I say culture, I mean the home, uh, the church, the school, the youth agency. For the most part, they assume the, that the child remains quite dependent, increasing gradually through, uh, let's say, uh, elementary school. Then, when, as he enters junior high, he, the assumption is he's more dependent than when he was in the eighth grade or seventh grade. Uh, then, I think in college, in high school and college, they assume, we assume a, an increase in ability to be self-directing. That, uh, that diminishes, though, between, college, between high school and college. I think college freshmen are assumed to be more dependent than, than high school seniors, uh, for example. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, a right. wavy curve. But the, the, the point here is that it's not until the very end of the teenage period that our culture assumes a person is able to be self-directing. At some magic age, it's 18, 18 or 21. 21, what not. Now, the, inter the, the interesting thing about this chart is that there is a peak uh, gap between the, the individual's need and capacity to be self-directing and the culture's assumption of his ability to be self-directing here during adolescence. The greatest gap between the need and the, and the cultural perception, which I think explains what the youth rebellion is all about. Sure, I would, I would agree with that. Uh, thinking about that then in, in the classroom, um, what, what should the learning climate be if we are going to think about the broader application right. of this uh, into, say, the public school classroom, for example? Well, uh, in essence, as I see it, Roger, school, schooling should be concerned primarily with developing in the students skills in engaging in self-directed inquiry. And from the first grade on, 
the focus of the of, of teaching in the school should be on developing the skills of engaging in self-directed inquiry. So I would see uh, uh, the curriculum of the school really being just a sort of a spiral of, of, of inquiry projects, starting with the curiosities of the student of the first grade and, and, and having them engage in, in uh, inquiries regarding their curiosities, then another set of curiosities of the second grade, curiosities about language, curiosities about mathematics, curiosities about the world, and so on. So I would see the climate of the, of the school being one of, uh, uh, of self-directed uh, self learning with the teacher serving as a, as a manager of this process, a facilitator, a resource person uh, to it, but, uh, and, and where relevant, a transmitter of information. But, but a transmitter of information only in the context of the, of the inquiries that the students are engaging in. So then a student might actually go out into the community, for example, and, and use some sort of a learning resource oh, out there. Precisely. The, the, the notion that the only resource for learning is the teacher, I think, is, is anti-educational. There, there are a rich variety of resources in other students, in, in the community agencies, in travel, in all sorts of things. Uh, what about the, the learning climate within the classroom now? They're going to, any person is going to spend an amount of time in the classroom. And uh, like today, we, we have sort of an informal setting here for our discussion uh, with the coffee and the table between us where we can just sort of chat. Is this applicable to the classroom? Yeah. And of course, of course, the, the newer uh, architecture of schools, I think, is taking this into account. The, uh, the um, traditional auditorium with, with the chairs in rows bolted to the floor is, is really disappearing awfully fast. And in its place are coming uh, classroom atmospheres that look more like living rooms or parlors uh, with, with comfortable chairs uh, adjusted to the s different sizes of the students uh, with uh, tables uh, to put things on. And, uh, and they can be moved around moving, perhaps for a small group right, or something right, like that. Right, right. Yes, I think this is a, uh, an important um, part of the new technology is, uh, the, is making it possible for students to move rather quickly from small group work to total classroom work, and then back to small group total classroom work, this kind of uh, rhythm. Now, you, you mentioned just prior to this part uh, the idea of the, the teacher as a manager or a catalyst. Now, um, the pedagogues might, might wonder exactly what you mean by that. Could you explain that a little further? Yeah. Um, this is a very subtle thing that, that when it gets across to students, however, makes an awful lot of difference in the learning. Uh, if they perceive the teacher as being an authoritative transmitter of a predetermined knowledge, then their, their just intuitive relationship with the teacher is that of dependency. The, the, the student who sees the teacher as being a transmitter of knowledge relates to that a teacher in a dependent role, and the teacher expects that and, and induces that kind of relationship. It affects their entire outlook on uh, the class situation. And on what learning is. Certainly. Sure. Now, on the other hand, if the teacher comes into the classroom situation seeing his or her role as being to facilitate the, the organization of self-directed learning experiences by the, by the students and sees himself or herself as a resource for the, the students to turn to as they would turn to a book or turn to a community experience or to any other resource if they start looking at the teacher as another resource for learning rather than as a, an authoritative transmitter of prede predetermined knowledge, then a whole different kind of, uh, of learning process gets induced. Uh, can you, from, uh, from your experiences in using andragogy, then can, can you give me an example of um, going into say any kind of a classroom setting and, mm -hmm. and maybe it's not your particular subject matter strength yeah. but uh, going in it and using andragogy to set up that class setting. Yeah, in incidentally you raise a very interesting point. I don't see the true educator as necessarily being the primary uh, information resource for a learning. I see the true educator as being primarily the manager of the learning processes. And in my own practice, for example, Roger, uh, uh, one day I may be working with engineers uh, that, in, in which I don't know anything about their subject matter, but I know about the process of engaging them in, in a learning experience in which they use resources that have the subject matter knowledge. Uh, and the next day I may be working with physicians or nurses or social workers or uh, uh, government uh, officials. Um, now, the, 
the process that I use involves, I have a rule of thumb that of these, what, eight steps or so that I lined up in the process design, climate setting, establishing a mechanism for planning, diagnosing needs, etc. cetera, uh, as a rule of thumb, I, it's in my practice, I, I devote about a quarter of the total amount of time available to the first five steps up through designing, developing a, a design, a sequential design of learning experiences. And then three quarters of the time is spent on the conducting of the learning experiences. Uh, so if I have a one-day institute, then, you know, like uh, for eight hours, then two hours will be, will be spent on climate setting, uh, 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 diagnosing needs and interests, planning, a, uh, formulating objectives, and planning a sequence of, uh, of learning experiences. And then, and then six hours will be spent on the learning experience uh, activities and evaluation. In a 15-week uh, course, about four sessions, sure. four three-hour sessions are devoted to the first five steps and, and uh, 12 to the remaining, uh, the remaining two. Well, I, I've had some experience in trying to apply the principles of andagogy in the classroom. And uh, gee, from my experience, those first few hours are, can be very frustrating. Yes. The, for both the student and for the instructor or the catalyst in this situation because the student is wondering, you know, why aren't we on chapter four right. or why aren't we going right. faster with this? Right. And you really have to invest some early time uh, in order to, to in, make it In learning a new work. way of learning. Absolutely. In helping them learn a new way of learning. No, uh, absolutely. Uh, um, students have been so conditioned to come into an educational experience in a role, in an attitude of dependency toward the teacher that is rather shocking to them. Uh, they, they experience a cultural shock in coming into a situation in which they're immediately involved sure. in a collaborative relationship with the teacher. And it does take a lot of faith. Uh, you know, you have to have faith in the process that if you really use it, it'll work. And you have to have faith in the students that they really are uh, uh, capable of, uh, uh, of, taking of sharing responsibility with you. I, I recently read uh, an article where someone had set up a research design uh, trying to <laughs> test out some of the principles of andagogy and they found that at the end of the class where students had been involved in the planning and the implementing and the design of the course uh, that the achievement was not necessarily a lot greater that much but, different yeah but the attitude toward learning and toward the classroom setting and and it seems to me that that's a very important thing if we can promote a, an attitude toward learning absolutely so that they leave the class uh, feeling all charged up about going on further in their, in their inquiry process. And this is what we mean by lifelong, you know, continuing education or lifelong learning. Are some of your students uh, carrying out some research based yes. on this principle? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, in our, uh, our own at university, we have perhaps 15 uh, dissertation studies on andragogy, and other universities um, have an equal number, I'd say. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I've found in the classroom that uh, this allows, when you talk about the teacher as a catalyst, it, it really allows for not only the students to do a lot of learning, but for the instructor and he or himself. To every, and really every experience is a rich one. Well, I hope that we've been able to stimulate our, um, our viewers to um, uh, think of some things they'd like to experiment with in testing out these andragogical concepts.